Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for this uh, panel discussion on China's economic transformation uh, with our panelists, Ellen McGratton and Sietl Storsletten. I didn't really have to say that because he's being introduced by Jose Paris, our moderator, but I, I really wanted to say as correctly as I could, Sietl Storsletten. <laughs> Um, my name is Chris Phelan. I'm the chair of the Department of Economics. I did want to say a little about the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute. Uh, it was founded in 2010 with a mission of informing public policy and supporting frontier economic research. We think it's only natural that it's housed at the University of Minnesota Economics Department because it's born of the legis legacy of two great economists whose images were flashing every 10 seconds for the last half hour. Uh, the first is Walter Heller, who was responsible for major policy initiatives as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors for both Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. And also an economics giant, Leo Hurwitz, recipient of the Nobel Prize in 2007, who developed the theory of mechanism design, which lies at the heart of understanding many of today's economic issues. Through events such as these, we hope to communicate findings, spark dialogue and debate, and inform and influence public policy and practice. Now, after the panel discussion, uh, there will be rounds for questions and answers. This is being recorded, so please stand up if you want. When it's appropriate time to ask questions, please stand up. Someone will find you with a microphone, uh, and it'll help if you use it. Um, we are pleased to have one of our distinguished PhD alums joining us this evening uh, as our moderator. It's my pleasure to introduce Jose Paris, Senior Vice President and Regional Managing Director of Ascent Private Capital Management of U.S. Bank. Jose has been a tremendous resource for us as a member of the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute Advisory Board and really just a good friend of the department. Jose will moderate tonight's panel and introduce our panelists, professors, professors Ellen McGratton and Sietl Storslet. Well, thanks again for coming. Uh, I feel this is a very uh, sexy and attract attractive topic. Uh, the first thing I want to say, that we're going to start with talking about uh, with Kettle. Uh, you know, my, my, even though I have been in the United States for many years, uh, I, I have no problem pronouncing Ellen McGrathen, but Kettle is another <laughs> Kettle, so to speak. Um, Kettle comes to us from Norway. He got his undergraduate in Oslo, but he got his PhD in the uh, Carnegie Mellon. So, uh, but one of the things that we have in common, and I th see kind of the new head of the Fed welcome, uh, is that uh, he started uh, working with the University of Minnesota and working with the Fed. So the Fed has been a great connection between the uh, professors at the Department of Economics. So he has done a lot of work in macroeconomics, and he's going to start talking about the economic transformation of China from the inside. Then we're going to have Helen McGrathen talk to us about the economic transformation from the outside. Helen started at the Boston College, and then he got a PhD from Stanford. But then again, he has been a very impressive uh, sort of career at first at the Fed and then a professor at the University of Minnesota. Now he's, she's one of the great stars of our department. So with that, I would like to have you start, please, uh, with uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, I think I'm going to sue my parents for giving me an unpronounceable name. but. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, um, I'm going to talk about the biggest economic miracle in history. The rise of China, if you look at the size of the total economy, it went from, in 1980, being an economy of the size of, I don't know, Scandinavia or something like that. And then by today, it's bigger than uh, the US and bigger than the European U Union. Now, as economists, we don't care so much about uh, size. Let, let other people worry about that. But what we do care about is uh, what we call GDP per capita, or income per person, value added per person. 
So this graph here shows uh, the income per capita, or GDP per capita in China relative to the US. So I want you to look at, at the beginning here. Um, in, uh, um, in the 70s, China was a communist country. Mao uh, uh, Zedong was, uh, was in power, he died in 1976. GDP per capita in, in China was about 3% perhaps of the level of the United States. So um, at the level of Chad, roughly, uh, uh, the poorest African nations. Then in, in um, 1978, Deng Xiaoping took over. And as you can see, something happened. There was an acceleration of growth, and then another acceleration of growth in, at about, in about uh, around 1990s. And, um, and, and from being uh, an economic basket case, China is today a middle income country with a, with a GDP per capita roughly a quarter of the United States. Now, that rapid change, the rapid economic growth, so, um, when, when, um, did not happen in the standard way. So, so as economists, we like to we like to look at we uh, we looked at, like to look at how countries grow, and and that turns out, turns out to be uh, a lot of remarkable similarities across countries when they when they grow, but but China somehow is very different. There are a lot of things that are different there. So, for example, what what typically happens um, uh, over time is that um, the rate of return on capital can be very high in the beginning. But over time, that rate of return on capital fall, tends to fall. Wages tend to grow, t uh, t are, are low, tend to be low in the beginning uh, uh, for, for poor countries. But the wages grow roughly at the same speed as GDP. That doesn't happen in China. Wage growth has been very slow until recently. Now, and, and the, 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 the weirdest thing, even though the rate of return on capital is very high, has been remarkably high there. Nevertheless, the country has every year for, uh, for uh, 25 years had made sustained and large trade surpluses. Why would a country that has a high rate of return on capital, why would they export capital? Capital should be flowing in there and not out of there. Um, I'm going to talk about why that happened. Um, and it's going to have to do something with banks. All right, said the trade surplus. This is the wrong slide, but OK, I can give you the slides. So, um, so what I want to do now, I want to talk you through this, um, uh, talk you to this period and that period. So in the, in, the, in the 1980s, the first thing Deng Xiaoping did was to reform agriculture. Remember, at the time, most people worked in agriculture. And um, uh, Deng Xiaoping had the view that so, and, and agriculture was dominated by, by um, uh, collective farms. And he had the view that, that uh, with controlled prices, he thought that it didn't work so well. If, you could, if, if people could take more responsibility, they could get ownership of what they themselves produced and sell those goods at market prices, that would, that would generate growth. And it generated an, an enormous growth in, ag in agriculture. But, but the state kept control over manufacturing and, and whatever happened in urban centers. However, there was a lot of experimentation at the time. They set up some so-called special economic zones where they let firms experiment with market prices. That, um, um, that was... Um, that was a big success. Going into uh, the 1990, um, there was a, there was a recession uh, associated with uh, that uh, more or less coincided with Tiananmen Square, uh, and and after that, uh, the the country embarked on a major set of broad reforms. It it where gradually the economy got more privatized. That's a major. Major change. 
it happened as everything in China happened gradually. Uh, it, it started with w the welcoming of foreign firms and, and, and very um, industrial policy meant to attract foreign firms and new technology. And Ellen is going to talk a lot about that later. Uh, but, but still, they kept a, a tight lid on Chinese running domestically financed firms. Then one day, so Deng Xiaoping stepped down in, in, uh, in, in 1991. Some time after he had retired, one day he decided um, to go with his daughter to a major city in southern China. He asked, can I give a speech? And people said, yeah, of course. Nobody is going to provide, deny you that. So he st stood up and he had, he had a speech which, with, 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 ha which had a, an explosive content. He said, look, China needs to embrace broad privatization. We need economic growth, and that can only happen if we open up, if we extend the, the responsibility system to the industry as well. We should embrace private firms. That is going to give us productivity growth and economic growth. That's the only way we can, we can survive as a country, we can prosper as a country. And obviously, Deng Xiaoping wanted the Communist Party to survive. And his, he, his idea was that only if the Communist Party can deliver growth can they survive. So, um, and then he went, next day, he went to the next city, gave the same speech. And that had an enormous, it, it met an enormous popularity in, in the south, southeast, that is. Uh, so the leaders in the Communist Party in, in, in Beijing, they were taken completely by surprise. And kind of overnight, uh, they, they decided, okay, fine, uh, we can allow private firms. Um, so, so that started in 1992. They, they, the most, for a lot of sectors of industry and manufacturing, they allowed then private firms to operate. Not all. I'm going to come back to that, to, to the not all part. Um, over time, that, that kind of expanded. Um, uh, the country allowed more, uh, eventually ended up welcoming private firms. So the, the, when they realized, when, when, they, when they saw how private firms operated, and, and the state-owned firms, to a large extent, had to operate with the market prices, um, they realized that these state-owned firms that, that completely dominated manufacturing were making huge losses. So that led to, uh, in, they didn't know what to do. But in uh, 1997, <coughs> at the five-year Congress, they made a major decision, namely to expose these state-owned firms to competition. And, um, uh, and to, to competition and, and, and stop subsidizing loss-making state-owned enterprises. Uh, it sounds like a small thing, but it was a major, for, uh, it was a major reform. Um, and um, so the, uh, the, the Chinese, they like slogans. So the slogan for this one was, grab the large, release the small. Anyone who has done fishing knows what that is. And, and what it meant well, basically was to let go of the loss-making ones. Uh, that created a huge amount of reallocation of, um, uh, of uh, resources. Uh, so the, with the exit of less productive state-owned enterprises, the entry of more productive, uh, um, to some extent more productive state-owned enterprises and more productive private firms. And I'm going to talk a lot about that point in a moment. It, it also coincided with a, with a purposeful um, uh, industrial policy. There were also some other <coughs> major changes that happened in the 1990s. In particular, um, the, there was an emphasis on new values and new career paths for the cater or the, the cadre, the, the, the officials in the Communist Party. The, the, the leadership pushed the idea, since they, they wanted to have economic growth, they pushed the idea that, look, we should promote the people who are able to generate growth in their city or in their province. So <clears throat> to think about that, you used to be, uh, you used to be a mayor of some, some dinky city uh, uh, running uh, things as usual. Suddenly, the, you get the clear message that if you deliver growth, then you will have a chance to be promoted. Um, uh, that created an enormous amount of competition uh, between local um, local um, jurisdictions, and even though the system is is OPEC, uh, OPEC, and and um, and there are a lot of frictions, so to speak, still that 
that this push towards more business friendliness, uh, uh, I, I think meant a lot for the for the for the growth in in productivity and growth in uh, uh, and 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 adoption of technology and an emergence of the private sector. Um, while the <clears throat> growth in the 80s were driven by in increased productivity in uh, in agriculture, the growth after 1990 was to a large extent driven by reallocation. Reallocation from rural, from agriculture towards uh, uh, industry and, and reallocation within the manufacturing sector. So private, privatization that is. Here's a little graph showing the extent of that. It shows it shows the, sh the share of um, the share of look at the lower uh, uh, graph here. It shows the, the share of workers employed in uh, um, in private enterprises as a share of um, workers uh, as a, a total workers in manufacturing. As you can see, it's a, it's a tiny amount, just ju just about five percent. But or uh, within within a decade, it grows to sixty percent. So. These are large numbers. We're talking about 50, 60 million workers being shedded from state-owned enterprises and being hired by private, more productive enterprises. And Ellen is going to tell you why those pr private enterprises and why these joint ventures were so much more productive than the old state-owned enterprises. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little story with some actors. The story about China. So the actors here are households, entrepreneurs, state-owned enterprises, and banks. So imagine households live their usual life. They earn a wage, uh, they s consume some, and they save some. The only place they can save is to put the money in the bank. I know stocks to buy, at least not back in the 1990s. This is the early on. So they put the money uh, in the bank. Uh, the bank uh, can do three things in principle. They could lend to state-owned enterprises. They can buy foreign assets. Uh, or they could lend to private enterprises. But for some reason, they don't. One of those reasons is that uh, property rights are not very well enforced. So it would be difficult for them to get the money back if the private enterprises were to go down, whereas the government, to a large extent, guaranteed loans by the state-owned enterprises. Another reason is that those banks are all state-owned and to a large extent want to favor the, the, the state-owned enterprises. Anyway, imagine you're an entrepreneur. You have an idea, you run a little firm, you earn some money, you consume some of it. The rest, all of it, you plow it into the firm because it's an, a very good firm. It just doesn't have very much capital. So you cannot hire that many people. But you hire as many people as you can. You have a tiny firm, you would love to borrow from the bank, but you're not allowed. What happens? Well, over time, it's a good firm, so they make money. Over time, they, uh, they, uh, they, they earn more, they're able to consume more, and also save more. They plow more stuff into their, into their private firm. That private firm grows. That means they, they hire a lot of the workers that usually used to work in the state-owned enterprises are now working here. Um, wages are higher. Um, they consume some, they save some, so more stuff has been saved in banks. But the banks, they, they lend still to the state-owned enterprises, but there just aren't that many. They don't, the, the demand for borrowing is not so large. So they have to, and they still don't want to lend to the private firms. So that means they have to buy more reserves. And it continues. And this is the situation we have today, where the state-owned enterprises are, are relatively small and the private enterprises are large. And China, by the way, has accumulated a huge amount of, state of, uh, of foreign reserves. It, the, the, the predictions of that theory is that you will get low wage growth during that transition. Why? Well, usually, uh, when, 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 uh, in, this, in the standard world, when you invest more, um, that uh, the capital grows and you, you, the, the the, um, the firms have to compete for labor, and that bids up the wage. It doesn't happen here. Why? Because when these want to hire more people, they just hire some of the people, leave. The state, they crowd out the state-owned enterprises. That doesn't end until all of them have left. And that's roughly 
where we are, uh, uh, close to where we are now. Um, you also get the return doesn't fall because you can because the reason why your return usually falls is that when you when you invest more, wages go up. Uh, it's not that profitable. But here, since wages don't increase, profits have kept being high for these entrepreneurs. You get fast um, uh, output growth and accumulation of of, of uh, trade surpluses. Now, fast forward to 2008, um, and well, uh, 2012 actually, or now, we've had we're behind us a large a, a period with very high growth. But, but arguably, the last couple of years, that growth has slowed down a bit. It used to be more than 10% per year. And I, I think we've, the world has never seen so fast growth for so, such an extended period of time for such a large economy. It's slowing down now. In, in, uh, in 2015, if we can believe the numbers, the growth rates are at 6.9%, which is high but low compared to what it used to be. The, the new growth target, I'm going to get back to that, but the, the, the government's target growth is 6.5% over the next five years. We've also seen a fall in, in, in productivity and the fall uh, uh, and, and, and the growth, big growth in investment and also some wage growth. Now, the concern that, that Chinese policymakers have, and you... Anyone you, you meet uh, is thinking about this. It's the middle income trap. So it, it turns out that a lot of countries have, have, have that took off when they were very poor. Once they reached about 30% of the world frontier, they stagnated. Okay? Some people have called it the middle income trap. I don't know if it's a good term. But let me just show you a little graph from made by um, the IMF that illustrates this. So this, this graph has um, uh, lists on the x-axis years from the start of the transition. A bunch of countries, a, a bunch of economic miracles that started with an income of uh, less uh, about 6% uh, of the US, $3,000 per, per year, per person. And then uh, for, for a decade or two decades, had very fast growth. Once they made it to about $10,000, a number of them stagnated, Peru, Brazil, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc. Whereas some continued, Korea and Taiwan, remarkably. China's here. So you see, China's grown faster than all of them combined. Um, but but uh, the people are worried, policymakers are worried now that it's going to end here. So what's the, policy, what's the policy response? It has been... Um, before I tell, let me skip to here. In, as, we, as you know, in 08, a big crisis hit the world, the financial crisis. Um, China was in this situation where they had an enormous uh, uh, saving. Um, and they were worried about uh, what would happen. And a bunch of economists said, well, the way to deal with it is to really spend. You need to, you need to have a stimulus package. And China said, OK, fine, we can do that. Um, and um, in fact, they spent, uh, they, the plan announced in 08 was to spend about 13% of GDP on a bunch of products over the next two years. That's a big stimulus package by, by, by any standard. And the plan was to spend about a third on public infrastructure and about a quarter on rebuilding of, um, of Sichuan, uh, which was hit hard by, by an earthquake. And a lot of it was, uh, the rest was basically, the government would tell the, the state-owned banks, you have to lend more. You have to lend more. And who did those banks, who got those money from the banks? Well, uh, it, was, um, um, it was not the, it, it was not the, the small, efficient firms. It was a large state-owned firms. So it was, so when you suddenly push money out, you obviously you have to lower the interest rate a bit in order to make the, the, the state-owned firms take it. it you're going to get the same response as I described earlier, just in reverse a bit. So, so you, get, um, you get a lot of money challenged to local governments 
to do construction, mining, pet pro various pet projects, um, uh, you get uh, st state-owned enterprises expanding again. And if you remember the graph I showed you earlier, where I showed you how the private firms had kind of overtaken employment, and they reached about 60%, but then it stopped in 08, that's the stimulus package. At least we think so. Um, so um, it worked, kind of, in the sense that uh, China was able to maintain growth, high growth, during the Great Recession. It reduced a bit the trade surplus, as the, as the little theory suggested should. Uh, it accelerated wage growth, because now the state-owned firms, they had to compete for labor to get, the, to, to, to get back. It did, made a lot of improvements in infrastructure. A lot of roads have been built over the last five years. Um, it created a, a credit boom. The question is, did you get, uh, uh, perhaps there were a lot of, un it could be that a lot of unnecessary infrastructure projects were built. Now, um, let me get back to the policy response. So, the, the response to the, to the threat, so to speak, of the middle income trap has been more state capitalism and, and, and less liberalism. In, with, the, with, the, um, uh, with the advent of the new leader, Xi, there has been the reform process has stagnated a bit. So the way it used to happen uh, the, is that sector after sector of industry and services would be liberalized. It has stopped. So for example, the, there was a plan to liberalize uh, telecommunications. It hasn't happened. There was a plan to, to, to liberalize uh, financial industry. It hasn't happened. Um, there's been a, a renewed emphasis on state on enterprises. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and as I said, a boom in public investment. There is no reform of the judicial system, something that's dearly needed. Um, the focus of the government has been anti-corruption and has shifted a bit away from privatization and growth. Uh, it leaves us here. The current challenge is overcapacity or um, the, the Chinese slogan or the, the, the Chinese coined the, word, the term the three overcapacities. So there's an overcapacity in capital intensive industries. During this period, a lot of the, the state owned enterprises, at least those who remained, were in very capital intensive industries. And those were the ones who expanded uh, with the stimulus package construction, uh, steel, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there is a, uh, uh, we see that the capacity utilization in those industries are falling like a rock. There was a, there was a building boom, again, uh, funded by Local government don't have the capacity to tax, but they can do one thing. They can sell land, they can develop land, and sell it. That has been an important source of revenue. They did that. When they saw house prices going up, it was a money pump, so they thought. Now there are too many houses, especially in urban areas, uh, and rising vacancy rates. They tried to deal with it uh, by forcing uh, farmers to move to the city to take up, up those um, um, uh, some of those uh, available housing, but it, it's a problem. There's also a rising debt of local government and state-owned enterprises. Um, there are some good signs too. There's a huge emphasis on human capital um, uh, investments. Um, an enormous rise in, in um, enrollment rate for, uh, to university, for example. There is a huge rise in the R&D. So China, used, uh, China now has, has a share of GDP. China, China now has a higher, uh, um, has, has an R&D rate roughly at the level of the European Union. Uh, not clear that all of that R&D is, is well invested, but it's clear that, that China's, the industrial policy of China is to go in a direction of more, uh, more in, um, innovation-led growth. Time will show if they will succeed. Ellen. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, it's hard not to be dazzled 
by the facts that Jettel shows us, especially the ones early on. It's very rapid growth. But the more interesting thing, and the reason why uh, China is very interesting for economists, is that we see that they're not satisfied to be suppliers of the trinkets you're buying in Walmart. They're ready to move to the technological frontier. So we see a big shift to high-tech production. We see a big shift or big increase in inward flows of foreign investment. And if you talk to a development economist, this is their dream scenario, that not only are they growing rapidly, but they seem to be on a technological trajectory to become among the ranks of the advanced countries. So Jettel showed you this picture. I won't dwell on it. But this is the picture that everyone who talks about China starts with, that they started in 1990 below 5% of the US, and they're up around 25%. A picture you probably don't see very often is if you go to the National Science Foundation and you take their data and you look at global production, and here I'm going to be focusing a lot on production, you see that of the manufacturing sectors, high tech, aerospace, semiconductors, telecommunications, China is catching up to the US in being the global producer of high tech goods. And here I'm including, when I say HK, that's Hong Kong. In the early 90s, we see the, the foreign direct investment just surge. This is a picture of foreign, inward foreign direct investment relative to GDP. Now, there's three sources, uh, the three main sources of foreign investment. One is foreign direct investment, and that's going to be uh, uh, multinationals going into countries abroad and you know, building factories and producing. There's also portfolio investment. That's households holding equity shares and debt in other countries, but they don't have any managing control. In China, that's very small. The main uh, source of actual investment in companies, corporations, would be through foreign direct investment. So I'm going to focus my attention on that. There's a third source, um, which is of interest to central bankers, uh, reserve assets. But that's not going to be really, you know, how many reserve assets they're holding isn't going to be the main underlying story of innovation and growth. So I'm going to focus my attention on the main kind of potential source of China's trajectory to the technological frontier. And that's encouraging foreign investment having foreign multinationals come to China and, and produce. And what they really want is production of high-tech goods, because that's going to be their way to catapult to, to the advanced level. So if we look at pictures like that, we, we realize that you know, there's a lot of people paying attention. There's companies who want access to this big market, it's a huge number of people. There are investors interested in China's shares because their companies seem to be you know, switching to high-tech stuff, and governments are taking notice. But I think it's more interesting if we look a little bit deeper into the data. If you dig a little bit deeper, what you find is China's foreign direct investment, while it's increasing a lot, Little comes from the United States, and little goes to the United States. So here we are sitting in the United States thinking there's this giant miracle. We're here where there's a bunch of multinationals who have developed high-tech goods. They've already made the investments. China's opening up. We should imagine that there's going to be a ton of investment going in. And then as they're coming towards the frontier, there's going to be a ton of investment going out. So if it's not coming to and from the United States, where is it going to and from? So here's a picture of flows. I've done all units in 2014 dollars. So these are billions of dollars in foreign direct investment. I'm showing you China and the United States, just so you can get a sense of numbers. So on the left side, you see China's flows in and out in the early 90s, when they're not doing much, 
Contrast that with the ins and outs of the United States. And then you have see the ins and outs. So again, money flowing in and money flowing out for China in the current period, and then for the United States. I've drawn two bars. It's hard. You're going to, for those of you who have poor eyesight like myself, get out your strong glasses, because I've shown the total, which are the two colors put together, and then I've shown the part in green that comes to China from the United States, a really small sliver still. And then I've shown how much goes um, in and out of the United States to China and to other places. So the white is other, the green is China. The white is other, the green is China here. So the in is out. So it's just a sliver you can barely see. So maybe the US is not, maybe it's not the US. Maybe it's other advanced countries. Maybe it's, you know, the Western Europeans, Germany, uh, France, UK, maybe it's uh, Japan. So let's look again at that graph, but we'll look at flows that are coming from the other advanced countries to and from China and the United States. Well, OK, same graph. Now we see a little bit more on the green, of the green on China. But look at the United States. The United States is very much engaged with flows in and out of advanced countries. And here I'm not including Canada, Australia, and all those. I'm just including Europe and, and um, and Japan. So the real mystery are these two question marks. Who's the other? All right, so now I'm going to show you a picture of a globe, and I thank Matt for helping me with this. It's a little bit blurry. But um, these are the inflows to China. Here's the key. So I'm taking the total 118 billion, and I'm going to give you kind of a color coded. This isn't per capita. This is just totals. You'll see two blue arrows. I had to do arrows because the spots are too small for you to see. They are the United Kingdom islands. Here I want you to think about British Virgin Islands, and I want you to think about Cayman Islands. Those are the big ones. And then HK, that's Hong Kong. So most of the white, in fact, 70% of that white bar was actually coming in from the Caribbean islands and from Hong Kong. What about the outflows? Where is it going? Sorry, this is kind of blurry, but where is it going? Here again, we have strong numbers for British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, and Hong Kong. And I want you to kind of see this is in absolute numbers. So the same orders of magnitude are going to two little Caribbean islands as they are to the United States. OK? So most is coming from these other smaller nations. and. And Hong Kong is part of China, so it's really round-tripped to and from uh, the Caribbean and Hong Kong for, for tax purposes. But then that leaves us with a giant puzzle. Because US, Western Europe, Japan have what China wants. They have large stocks of knowledge. Think of the accumulated R&D, the accumulated brands that show up in patents and trademarks have already been developed, sitting there, ready to go. They want access to China's huge market. China, on the other hand, has a huge market, and they want the stuff. So what's going on? If you take the facts and you use a theory that um, that I've used with Ed Prescott in an earlier study of the United States, you would predict that a huge amount of, of capital should be flowing in and a huge amount should be flowing out. 
So that leaves us with a puzzle. What we needed to do was recruit our, our friend Tom Holmes, who's sitting back here, to look under the hood at the microdata. And what we did was we studied the multinationals in China. We tracked down their organizational arrangements. Like, for example, uh, Jeto mentioned the, the joint ventures that, that they have to engage in, especially if you're high tech. And we tracked each and every patent in China. We tracked it. And we figured out why the capital flows were so small. What was the answer? The answer is China's quid pro quo policy. Now, what do I mean by quid pro quo? The quid is technology transfer. These arrangements that are mandated China mandates that, that certain kinds of firms, it's not all firms, it, it's specific, especially if you have the kind of stuff they want, high tech stuff. You must do a joint venture. So if you're General Motors, you're going to do a joint venture with Shanghai GM. And you're going to set up R&D centers, and those R&D centers are going to be producing new patents and new technology. Now, very importantly, and this is where um, Tom read, I think, most of the patents. What he discovered was the property rights are staying in China. So even if you develop a patent between General Motors and Shanghai General Motors, or Alcatel-Lucent and Shanghai Bell, when they apply for patents outside of China, ownership stays with the parent, the original multinational. Ownership rights for the Chinese only stay in China. So it's, in some sense, trapped in China. Now, that's not a bad thing for the Chinese. It still means they're getting a lot of technology and they're moving towards the frontier. The quo, what did the, what did the companies get? They get market access. And they're not there to set up an export base because this quid pro quo is a bit of a tax. They wouldn't do it except that they want domestic sales. So this policy, quid pro quo, If that's in place, one would expect that flows into China are going to be lower because there are these technology transfers which act like a tax. There's a benefit because when they transfer it, at least the Chinese aren't going to tax themselves. In other words, there will be some productivity gains. But the companies are going to hold back. They're not going to bring everything to China. We see the flows out lower because the property rights are staying in China. If the property rights, if they could unleash all over the world, all over the globe, we would see large outflows from China. If the arrangements are such that they can only have property rights in China, we'll see that the foreign direct outflows are low. But what's interesting is to actually quantify. So that's what economists do. We quantify the benefits and costs of these policies. Here's what we found. By following the quid pro quo, so we took two economies, what we see now, and then a, a counterfactual. Imagine there was no quid pro quo. And then compare consumption and income, et cetera, in the two economies. What we're going to find is that China enjoys 5% more consumption each year. So suppose you earn $10,000, consumption is, say, 60% of income. That's 6,000. You take 5% of that. That's $300 okay, every year, every person. US, Europe, and Japan, though, lose. They get, so US, for example, has half a percent lower consumption every year. So suppose the typical. Uh, a guy earns $50,000, um, and it's a half a percent, and 60% is consumption. That's about $150 per person per year. Okay, That's the kind of numbers we're talking about. So we see big welfare impact, and we see big 
We called it technology capital. That's our words for the knowledge capital. That's the accumulated R&D. China, under the policy, has 50% more accumulated R&D. So they have figured out a way to get to the frontier. The advanced countries that were coming in lose some. I mean, there is going to be some transfer of that technology. Now, the gains for China are so big, even if everyone applied quid pro quo, they'll do it. They'll gain. They'll do it and they'll gain. OK. So actually, the bottom line of all this is the bottom line of all talks we ever give in Minnesota. Economic theory is great. It helps us organize the facts. And we can analyze policy. In this case, uh, it helped us organize the facts about the capital flows, which were very puzzling if you just kind of think, you know, just looking at the data itself. And uh, it helped us figure out why China follows the quid pro quo. They're really gaining a lot. It's very beneficial to them. There are some losses. To the, to the other countries, but the multinationals are gaining by going in. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Thank you. I'm going to start with the questions. Kind okay. of, uh, so um, that doesn't sound very exciting about this quid pro quo. Let's tell us about, a little bit about uh, why this whole thing about the markets, the currency, has been such an impact on the world markets. Is it uh, you know the lower growth expected? How do you see uh, the Chinese sort of stock market driving? What is the relationship between the sort of flows in the financial markets? Do you want to take that one? Um, <laughs> so um, the two major uh, uh, impacts. One is the what Bernanke called the savings glut. So the Chinese have saved. A lot. This in big increase in 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 in, in saving um, in, in the world has has been to a large extent driven by China, and um, um, the consequence of that, we believe that that is something that has contributed. Not not the only thing, but one factor that has contributed to, to the low uh, interest rates, at least according to uh, Caballero and, and, and co-authors. I would like to stress, though, that we should be thankful for what has happened in China. The, 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 rapid, TF, the rapid growth in productivity is something we, we benefit from as, um, as, um, as um, um, the whole world benefits from that. We, we, we produce, when, when a lot of labor is left idle, that's, that's bad for the world. So. Um, uh, although the, 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 the rise of China, uh, the uh, production of, especially the, the increased production of, of low, certainly low uh, technology goods, is something that has co uh, caused a lot of reallocation in, in, in the West. Um, uh, pressure on low skill wages, for example. But it has also contributed to, contributed to uh, a growth of uh, uh, high tech industries. Um, so, good. Anything you want to add? So, good. Let's see if we have some questions on the audience. I have the big lights, so I'm going to yeah. need some help from folks in the audience. So, you have two major communist countries Russia and China. One has an economic miracle, and one is suffering. Do we have an answer? Well, they're about even now. They're about even in PPP. So the real, I mean, Jettel's uh, point about what happens next, like do they flatten out or not, um, they may stay even with Russia. I mean, kind of some of the facts that, I, that we discovered is that things aren't as rosy as you might see at first. So he brought up, for example, that a lot of our, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of R&D. 
according to the Chinese experts that I know, um, it's a man, they, they're, they've kind of set a goal of 2.5%, and so the government enterprises are getting some money, and they put a line item R&D. So you want to look under the hood a little bit, and you want to compare the data head to head. But Russia and China look about even now. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, but I would like to correct you a bit on the, on, on the facts there. So uh, starting in 1990, at the when, the when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Soviet Union was a lot richer than China at the time. The 1990s were not a good decade for the Soviet Union. As, as economists, we thought, well, you know, perhaps the best way to do it is just to the Big Bang. But the Big Bang came with, uh, uh, with very rapid privatization. It ended up giving uh, the firms to oligarchs. Uh, um, uh, and you had, you know, big crime taking over. So, um, uh, so, so actually, the Soviet Union, uh, the Russia has had a pretty good growth since uh, Putin took over. That's one reason why Putin is very popular. Uh, helped, of course, by the by, by the resource boom. Um, yeah. So I, th I think that what we learn uh, is that looking back, uh, it seems that China did the right thing by uh, by emphasizing gradual uh, privatization and coupled with um, uh, with uh, um, industrial policy, which was, looking back, it was, they did the right thing. Is the population taking on that comment, the fact that the population in Russia is shrinking, uh, and China is aging quickly, has a big impact on the outlook for growth of Russia versus China? Do you perceive that? I'm not sure. Uh, it, it's hard to... Um, it's hard to write down models where the age um, distribution matter. It's easy to think that, well, perhaps you need young people to grow fast or something like that. But it, it's, uh, it, it's hard, uh, it, we used to point to Japan and saying, look, here's a basket case, they don't grow, uh, and they're aging, so aging must be bad. But, but uh, after 2000, the, uh, Japan has grown uh, faster than the US, for example. Uh, and even though they're growing very, uh, aging very fast, so it's, not, it's, not a, it's not easy to see a, a, a clear link. But one thing, though, is important is that um, um, China now has gone through a period where the costs, there are still not any old people. The, the share of people who are older than 70 is very low. And they've had, for a number of years, that had low costs in terms of schooling and so on. So they enjoyed somehow a holiday in needed government spending. That's going to change big time. Good question. Any other questions? Let, over there. Uh, let me follow up with this uh, communism. Um, <laughs> I was in Beijing for about a week, about 10 years ago, in just fabulous metropolitan area, except for the pollution, of course. Everything was a mess as far as pollution is. Have, have either one of you been there? It is, it's the dirtiest place you could ever be, and it probably still is. Um, but with the growth, amazing growth. I mean, Beijing was such a fabulous city. New construction, automobile traffic, parks, everything going. Um, how long do you think the communist government can continue to run this, this group of very intelligent people, very industrious people? How long can this uh, communist regime control you know, this country? And if they lose control, what would happen? to the, the economic growth that you know, has occurred over the last 20, 25 years. Can yes. I? Yeah. Um, so that's, um, that's a good question and a big one. Um, so if you take the political economy, so to speak, first, how long can they keep on and in the current form? It's important to remember that for the Chinese Communist Party, the one thing they really care about is staying in power. Staying, staying in power. They really want that. Given that, they want to, that the population does well. But it's really important for them to stay in power. 
And um, uh, now, we, there is a there, there, there is a so-called um, uh, academics have pushed the so-called modernization hypothesis. It means as a, an economy grows, as a lot of people become middle class, uh, they read books, uh, get more educated, democracy is going to uh, push its way. Um, it's hard to see that mechanism being at work in China. So we read, of course, about um, uh, some um, uh, people, uh, people who protest and so on. But the fact is there's very little of that. If you ask the average entrepreneur, the average entrepreneur is pretty happy with the government. They don't um, 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 workers in state-owned enterprises. They're pretty happy with the government. Now, um, I think the threat is that the the, the um, stagnation of reforms is going to could give a major economic backlash. It could stop the economic growth, and that I think could sp spur um, a, a lot of frustration. Now, if if it breaks, if they lose power, what is going to happen? And that that's that's a, a, a scary thought. So it's not clear that China would stay together as as one, and how the, if they break down is un, very highly unclear how they would do it. Um, uh, will will China continue? Is there a chance that they could continue to grow and eventually democratize? Clearly, the answer is yes. Um, they're on a path to to they're, they're following. If you uh, showed the little graph with uh, Korea, Taiwan, and, and and China, China follow exactly the steps of Korea and Taiwan, with with upgrading of industries, with the government being involved in somehow helping that uh, through technology transfers and, and and through incentives. So they are they are looking at Korea and Taiwan and think and thinking we're going to do like them, and not like an Indonesia. So uh, uh, th that's why they invest a lot in R&D, they invest a lot in, 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 in human capital. Uh, will that, uh, could that pay off? I, I, I believe so. The, Ch China, why should they have, why should they be at 25%? Why should, why should the wage of a Chinese worker be so incredibly low? They're not stupid. Uh, uh, just a matter of, in some sense, it's harder for an economist, it's harder to explain why a country can remain poor than to explain why they, uh, why they uh, don't grow it. It's natural. They could, in some sense, cope with the technology and, and, and produce. And I, I think that that could happen. Yes. Thank Sorry. you. Tom, do you have a question? Uh, do you want to give it? Excuse me? Oops. I'm going to give him the phone or the, over there. Oh, just right there. Thanks. Great, Hi. Uh, you know, I just want to come back to maybe something that ties your two presentations together around technology. Yeah. So if you look back at China's economic development, a lot of it was driven by um, the incentives given to local governments. You know, grow GDP, you get your, you know, your incentive yes. to continue to grow. You get more funds, you grow your GDP. And the way they did it was infrastructure construction. It's the easiest way you can drive growth. Um, have you seen any change in the incentive structure? around technology that they want to grow as a high-tech country and the way they're going to do it is to incent you know, the local governments to either invest in their own technology or buy firms? Or is that going to come from like the central government or, or from state or enterprises or private firms? Just All curious. the things that I talked about were certainly from the central. You know, there's a policy related to foreign investment. Um, the things he's talking about would be more local. Uh, locally based. So, remember, the idea of um, mer merit-based promotion is not something that we invented. It was invented in China 800 years ago. The first merit-based system of, of, of bureaucrats. Um, and, they, and they kept that. It survived. To, it's very natural to preserve that under communism. Um, and they, as I mentioned, it's a has been an important uh, incentive structure for local leaders to, to be able to deliver what, wh when is, do you not get promoted? Well, if there are a lot of protests uh, and if you don't grow. Now, uh, let me give an example. There was a backward city. 
um, one day they had an idea. Let's get a high-tech firm here. It's difficult, because remember, China is not scoring very well on, for example, uh, doing business. Uh, country number, I don't know, 151 or something like that, down there by, with uh, Chad. Now, uh, how, do you do, how do they do it? It takes, what, uh, uh, 150 days to start a firm or something like that, on average. Now, how would they, they, this city do it? Well, the major, mayor contacted Foxconn to produce, uh, 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 put together a lot of the iPhones you guys have. Um, uh, then I think there was in, uh, in, in April 09. In June, two months later, the head of Foxon came, met with the leader at the airport. A month later, um, could construction started to build this new factory. Um, they got, uh, I see this picture, where they, the highway is divided. There's a huge traffic jam on one side and one empty lane. And there's a sign that says, for the construction of Foxconn. So only people who were working on constructing that factory could drive on half the highway. Right? And, and uh, three months later, the factory was there and they started production. That's an example of how this local competition works for the good. It, but it's, it, it's complicated. Sorry. We have a question there. You made a comment about uh, China's R&D. And I've been skeptical about some of the reports about this massive R&D and whether it's productive. I remember a few years ago, I saw an article in Scientific American that looked at China's share of global patents. And it was actually very high, surprisingly high. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking to myself, I can't name one thing that China has invented in the past 100 years. So as you've looked into these patents, what are they? Are there, is there any value? Is there any real research going well, on? Well, so that's, that's, you know, Tom is the expert here, but uh, there was an explosion of patents in China. And um, that's what we were tracking, is looking to see those that went outside that could uh, make it on the outside to WIPO or to the US patents. And the ownership of the Chinese, the Chinese partner basically got his name taken right off. So they're, they, it's, it's joint ventures that lead to a patent, but then the arrangement is when they leave, it's you know, you would only see Alcatel-Lucent. So you wouldn't see the... But that would suggest there's just underreporting of Chinese innovation. Wouldn't that suggest underreporting of Chinese innovation? Well, it depends on what you mean by the reporting. So we see a huge, a ton of patents, um, but we don't see it, them leaving. We don't see ownership going back to China when they leave, when, it, when the patents leave China. So the big uptick in patents are in the Chinese patent system, not necessarily Chinese inventors in the U.S. or Western, or Western Europe system. Right. And okay. there's a lot of, um, Tom calls them junk patents. Yes. Uh, what's the actual word, Tom? Utility <laughs> patents or something. There are different kinds of those that are, uh, you know, things to block other guys uh, and, and then the real ones. But yet you look at the numbers and you're going to think, there's a huge amount going on, but then if you look around here, you know, ask yourself, where are the Chinese multinationals? There are some, but there's nothing compared to um, other countries, you know, Europe and Japan. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, just, uh, it's, it's um, so as economists, we think that, oh, innovation is really important. It's what's driving growth. Now, it's just really hard to measure it. Uh, we can measure the inputs, how much firms use on research and development. Uh, and we can count patents, but as you suggested, it, it's not, not clear that there's a link. But I can tell you one thing. If you look at Chinese firms, those who do research and development, R&D, those who do become substantially more productive over time than those who don't do in China. So that it's an indication, at least, that it's not just smoke. Would either of you address the uh, following issues? First of all, uh, China has one third of the arable land that the United States has. 
with obvious impacts on agriculture, yet four times the population. Secondly, the magnitude of pollution of air and water is vast and totally uh, underreported and undervalued, as is evidenced by many, many uh, documented issues recently. And thirdly, uh, the amount of fresh water that's available in China is, is extraordinarily low and diminishing. The effort to try to uh, change the flow of water from the, uh, what the Yellow River to the Yangtze River uh, is obviously a very desperate attempt at uh, uh, making water available. Would you address the questions of the impacts of pollution and water uh, on the economy? Okay, um, so it's a, I think that's a very uh, sharp observation. Clearly, that growth, that unprecedented growth we've seen, has come hand in hand with an unprecedented uh, deterioration of the environment. Now, uh, do, are the Chinese aware of that? The answer is yes. Um, and I think, um, I think so far it has been a trade-off. I think it's imp more important that children can go to bed not hungry than uh, necessarily breathing in uh, fresh air. But it's changing, and now it's come to a, to a level where, uh, it's, uh, um, where it's changing a bit, this unilateral focus on growth. Um, and there, there, are two, there are two camps uh, in, in, in China on this one. One is um, uh, that um, somehow state-owned enterprises have to take more responsibility, more the top-down approach. And there's another quite interesting uh, camp, uh, which uh, take inspiration of uh, uh, George H. W. Bush and Ronald Reagan. There, uh, if you remember, in the United States, um, acid rain was a very big problem, at least for Canada. And uh, uh, and uh, but the economists had a very simple solution: let's cap and trade, uh, and they did. Um, and, and the, 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 we learned two things from that. First of all, <laughs> the, uh, the policy was extremely effective at reducing the emissions. And second, uh, the, by, uh, it was surprisingly cheap to do it. Because firms, the, the worst firms closed down. And second, the, uh, the, the firms that they kept operating, they could m make some small investments that made, uh, made, made the production a lot more uh, efficient. Those gains are probably there in China, too. So I think we should hope that they have uh, um, the, the, good, the wisdom to follow uh, something akin to cap and trade uh, um, uh, policy. And, and, and yeah, that, that I think can, can, can deal with a lot of problems. We'll see um, the outcome. Alan, you want to add anything? No. <laughs> the the I one thing uh, that I just want to say, we, we study water. Water, we think it's going to be a big topic over the next uh, sort of two decades. And even in China, the water is not in the right places. And there has been an explosion of population uh, and in areas where there don't, it's not, don't have enough water. And clearly, China likes the Tibet uh, because they have a lot of water with coming through. And there has been proposals about you know, moving some of that water to them. But that would have a big impact on Southeast Asia. It's going to be an interesting kind of uh, developments. Um, any other questions? Question for Alan. So one thing I learned from you, uh, economic theory is right, but also Trump is right. Because, you know, we got, we got Say it again. Trump oh, is right, Donald Trump. Trump is right? Is yeah. that your statement? Yeah, because, you know, he said, they gain a lot, we lose. So we're getting a raw deal. This surplus is being created. They gain more than we lose, but we, so should we tax multinational? Should we prevent well, multinational so from doing business? So in some sense, yeah, they gain. It's beneficial for them, and we lose. Um, the solution would be that they follow the law. Um, in some sense, well, in, it's, it's a violation of the WTO agreement to have these quid pro quo rela it, um, arrangements. So enforcement of the law would solve the problem, but of course, you know, there's always going to be the implicit backroom deal because they're, they, 
you know, gain so much. So should we stop our companies from investing into China? Well, the companies gain too. <laughs> So, you know, the particular companies that get in are gaining. So that's what I'm saying is they keep it all hush-hush. There's surveys that are done of those companies, and, and we documented uh, some of that in our, in our work, that, and they've, they say, yes, we know this is a problem. We'd like to go in unfettered. We would like 100% ownership. Uh, it's not ha gonna happen, and so we put up with this, but um, it is against the law, the international WTO law. Not a very exciting message. It's good for General Motors to sell cars in China, but it's not for the auto industry in the United States to have those manufacturers go to China. No, well, it's the people in the United States. Yeah, is, we're losing, be, what happens is we don't, because some of it gets effectively taxed, we don't invest as much in new, we don't innovate as much. So there's the loss. I'd like to uh, understand what you think of the uh, financial system or the strength of their financial system in light of the uh, heavy debt you mentioned that a lot of local um, regional governments have uh, having invested in infrastructure and whether their banking system is sufficiently capitalized to um, carry that through. That's one for you. Uh, uh, so that's, um, uh, that is um, a big concern. Um, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, so in, in, on the heels of the big stimulus package, there was uh, the emergence of a shadow growth or shadow banking system, where uh, local governments would like to borrow. But the central government, so this is the game between the central government and the local government. So if you look at the total debt, local government has been increasing their debt. Uh, and central government has been accumulating wealth. But on the net, there is no problem. The, the Chinese <coughs> consolidated, the Chinese government, local uh, province and uh, local state and, and, and federal, is, is as a huge surplus. But it's the, it's the distribution that's the problem. So uh, the central government tried to prevent the local government from borrowing. Had a very tight co uh, constraints on banks from doing that. Now, with uh, everything changed in the 08, when they got scared, um, and, they, um, and, and when they let, uh, they loosened up, um, uh, l landing took off. They tried to tighten, and then this shadow, shadow banking, uh, uh, which, which is largely uh, local government guaranteeing some uh, loans, so they, at the end of the day, the local governments are the ones that, uh, that have the risk. Uh, and to some extent, uh, state-owned enterprises. Um, is it a, a problem? Uh, the, the banks, to me, it seems that the banks are, are quite undercapitalized, but remember they're owned by a very rich owner. So as long as that owner, the central government, the Communist Party, as long as they are willing to, at the time of crisis, they can, they can sell a trillion US T-bills and pay for that if they want to. The question is, the question is, will the central government let the local government fail or not? I, I cannot give you the answer to that, but they have the capacity to do it. Well, this is uh, fascinating. I know we could be here for many hours. Uh, I want to make sure I have a chance for you two to ask each other questions. Any questions you want to ask each other? <laughs> no. Maybe not. Uh, before we leave, I, I, I have a burning question, Ellen, uh, so I'm going to ask that. Is that how come the Chinese take all their money to Hong Kong and the British Virgin Islands and then they put it back in China. Could you explain that? Well, oh, so one question you might ask is, is it really coming from and back and forth? Um, because it could be that the US and Europe and Japan are just going through the, the, those islands. And so uh, in, our, in our project, we look to see who's going back and forth. And it looks like basically, uh, and the Chinese experts confirm, that basically it's, it's equal amount coming in and out um, into the islands and back for tax purposes. So they're trying to start. All countries do this. I mean, the United States sends it to Ireland through the Netherlands to Bermuda. India sends it to Mauritius. Russia sends it to Cyprus. All countries do this, but it's, it's most of the FDI for China. 
Great. We are going to have a reception afterwards. This has been uh, sort of a great uh, discussion and a great presentation. I would like a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm V.V. Chari. I'm director of the Heller Hurwich Economics Institute. Uh, so first, it's a distinct pleasure to have three such great uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, and I want to thank them on behalf of the Institute. We have a small, very small token of, of our appreciation. Uh, what's in there. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, no, thanks a lot is the wrong term. We're in a session on, on China, so I think it's appropriate to say she she. Uh, and so she she to, to all of you. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Ascent Cap Private Capital Management of US Bank, who co-sponsored uh, this, this event. Uh, and thank you very much for their generosity. Uh, we have a very active advisory board at the Institute, and so a number of our members of our advisory board have been very supportive are here. Jose, of course, uh, Ray Carter, Ed Foster, uh, Norm Rickman, Art Rolnick, and Kurt Winkleman are all here, and, and the Institute would like to thank them all. Uh, we also have two additional guests here tonight. Um, University of Minnesota Regent Laura Broad, I'd like to thank her for service to the university, and Kathy Schmittelkoffer, President and CEO of the University of Minnesota Foundation. I uh, want to thank her for her leadership. A um, couple of announcements. Our next event is going to be on May 16th. Um, as many of you may have heard, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis has launched a series of symposia on an issue that's been near and dear to the hearts of Minnesota economists for a long time, and that's the top general topic of Too Big to Fail, um, under the le leadership of Neil Kashkari, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, following the symposium, which will be at the Minneapolis Fed, uh, President Kashkari will be having a town hall symposium. Um, will keep you posted on, on exactly when that is, and that is an event that the Hellaher, which Economics Institute is glad to host. Um, so uh, the President Kashkari will be here to answer questions from the audience, and as always, we'll have a nice reception afterwards to keep the conversation going. Uh, so please visit our website, www.hhei.umn.edu, and we'll get uh, more information. So now comes the, the nice stuff, which is we'll go across the hall to the Johnson Great Room for refreshments. But before we do, let's thank the, uh, the speakers for such a great job. Thank you all.